um, owned by a lady in India. We're going to see a little video interview of her. It's very nice. Um, she lived in, in Bombay, and she owned a steamship line, many, many ships that took cargo back and forth from India to other parts of the world. So she arranged for a cabin in this nice little boat, the Jaladuta, for um, our teacher to travel from India across the Atlantic Ocean to America to carry the message of Krishna. So that's the extraordinary journey. And the subtitle, One Man's Journey into a Million Hearts. Uh, th this particular presentation was put together some years ago when we had uh, the centennial celebration of our spiritual master's birth. It was, he was born in 1896, so we had a big celebration in 1996. And then, so this, the, the 100th anniversary of, excuse me, the formation of ISKCON, yes, was formation of ISKCON, 1966. Add 50, 2016, right? Yes, was formation of So this is um, the time that this is dated, but the information is about his life. So some very nice photographs of, that's Srila Prabhupada, our founder, Acharya. The information is about his life. Um, Some very nice photographs. Behind what he was doing was a very ancient tradition. Um, ancient meaning timeless. You know, from the very beginning, very according to the, 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 the Vedic texts, all these books on the bookshelf up here, are from a, a, a set of wisdom literatures the called beginning. the Vedas. And the Vedas speak of um, creation and maintenance and, and cosmic annihilation. And if at the very beginning of creation, there was a creator who received the ingredients and the plan and he got his college degree and everything. <laughs> Sorry. He was imparted within his heart transcendental knowledge from the original source of everything and gave him the, the potency and the plan how to construct the universe. And if at the very beginning of creation there was... His name is Lord Brahma. So we're in the line of disciplic succession from Lord Brahma and he is the representative that brought the message of Krishna to us. The primary, the primary text is Bhagavad Gita because when Krishna came, he spoke. Many scriptures are about God. This is pretty unique. It's a sp scripture spoken by God directly. And the, the teachings are within the Bhagavad Gita. So he brought the message, he brought the Bhagavad Gita and its message along with this other very several volume series, Srimad Bhagavatam. And that was his starting point. With him, he brought those things. So how did he get started? At one time, he was a um, college student and married, and he had a friend. He was born and educated in Calcutta, so Bengali. And his father, we'll say Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada's father was uh, an elevated, you know, saintly man, a family man, but a very saintly man. And he carefully trained his son from childhood in the ways of character and devotion to God, devotion to Krishna. Specifically, that was his upbringing. And in the course of bringing saintly people to, to his home, 
Prabhupada saw some of these people weren't so genuine. They were wearing the, the outward dress of a, a holy man, but inwardly they weren't so holy. And he was able to detect it in various ways, didn't detail that. So one time, while he's in college, um, he had become a, an ardent follower of Mahatma Gandhi, to so just put things in historical context. The British had ruled in India for, for a couple hundred years. Gandhi came along and didn't like the idea that a foreign country was ruling our country. He felt this foreign country that's ruling our country is washing away our heritage and culture. And that heritage and culture is worth preserving. And so, you know, there's many other factors, but he began a not co non-cooperation. His, his idea was they're able to rule us in India because we're cooperating with them. So let's not cooperate with them, and they can't rule us, and then we have independence. It was a nonviolent, non-cooperation movement. He was the leader. And as a young college fellow, Srila Prabhupada was one of his leading advocates and followers, but he was a, by nature a leader. And so he was a leader in the Gandhi movement in Calcutta. And one of his friends, pictured here in this painting, invited him to come uh, meet a sadhu who's in Calcutta. And Prabhupada said, no, I've met so many sadhus. No, thanks. And his friend said, no, no, he's special. I've met him. Please come, please come, please come. So he went. And the, the painting is meant to show um, the scene on a rooftop and um, location just somewhere in the midst of Calcutta. And when, as soon as these two friends, Prabhupada, his name at that time was Abai. What, what was it? Okay. So, uh, as soon as they, Abai and his friend, s sat down and offered their respects before they even s had further exchange, he spoke up. You are an educated young man. Why don't you preach Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's message throughout the whole world? That was their first meeting. I mean, before there was any like, hello, how are you, what's your name? It was, it was very direction-giving, very compassionate. And so um, the young Abai replied, um, who's going to hear Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's message? Because we're subjugated by the British. Maybe after we become independent of the British, and we go outside of India, people will listen to us. But right now, they're not, we're just subjects of the British. How can we spread Indian culture if we are under British rule? Well, Bhakti said, no, this is before the, any, they, the discussion went further. He spent 20 minutes dismantling that argument. And, and some essential teachings are... Uh, you don't have to wait for a change in Indian politics because transcendence isn't dependent upon politics or who is ruling, who is not ruling. What's eternal is essential, and the, the essential characteristic of the soul is consciousness of Krishna or consciousness of the Supreme. It's not dependent upon who is, who is the political ruler of the time. It's the one thing that's important is important. It's exclusively important, so I can't wait. Here's some more text. 
whether one power or another ruled was a temporary situation. That these are words taken directly from a biography about Prabhupada's life. The eternal reality is Krishna consciousness and the real self is the spirit soul. No man-made political system, therefore, could actually help humanity. This was the verdict of the Vedic scriptures and the line of spiritual masters. Although everyone is an eternal servant of God, when one takes himself to be the temporary body and regards the nation of his birth as worshipable, he comes under illusion. The leaders and followers of the world's political movements, including the movement of Swaraj, Swaraj means Gandhi's movement, Swa means one's own, and Raja means to rule, so self-rule. Let us rule ourselves rather than being ruled by other people. We're simply cultivating this illusion. Real welfare work, whether individual, social, or political, should help prepare a person for his next life and help him reestablish his eternal relationship with his Supreme. And it goes on. If we don't understand the central point, there's diversities and there's isms and there's all kinds of things going on. We all come from the same source. If we can connect to that same source, we're moving in the right direction. Recognizing that eternal relationship with our source, that's the mission of human life. And it's so important you can't wait till Swaraj happens. It should happen immediately. And so forth. There's some other text here. True peace can only be found when we act and see things in connection with our ultimate source. Um, Srila Prabhupada was very moved. The message went in. So as we saw the date, here we saw, we saw the date. This is 1922. Several years later in 1925, excuse me, not 22, 33, as a householder, Srila Prabhupada received initiation. And it was the custom of Bhakti Siddhanta to, as is the custom in ISKCON, practice, conventional practice, I would say, is first initiation, sometime later second initiation. Uniquely, Bhakti Siddhanta gave him both at the same time when they met together in Allahabad. A nice photograph, the painting rather, of Srila Prabhupada. So, receiving his initiation beads, 1933. So 1922 to 1933, that means he's now 36 years old, young man, married with children. But so the dates are important in, in understanding the chronology of things. Um, sometime later in 1935, that's two years after his initiation, the painting is showing Prabhupada holding the hand of one of his sons. Together, he was with Bhakti Siddhanta, his spiritual master, along uh, in Vrindavan. So each year, during a certain month of the year, Kartik month, Bhakti Siddhanta would do what we often do, or we often do what he would do, which is he would take groups of devotees to the holy place of Vrindavan, and sometimes other places also. On this particular year, 1935, they were in Vrindavan, and Prabhupada is walking together with Bhakti Siddhanta. In the background, it shows some sannyasis with their... Um, staff, the sannyas rod, and Prabhupada as a householder. So, although a householder very much respected for good reason, and Bhakti Siddhanta was describing 
missionary work, same as their first conversation in 1922. Here's even the Sanskrit, because Prabhupada repeated the Sanskrit. Amar Icha, Chila Kichu Bhai Karana. I had some desire to print books. If you ever get money, print books. So it's two instructions now. Go to the West and speak the message of Lord Chaitanya. If you ever get money, print books. Standing by Radhakund and beholding his spiritual master, Abai felt the words deeply entering his own life. If you ever get money, print books. So this is the towards the end of 1935. And then again in 1936, December 36, I am fully confident that you can explain in English our thoughts and arguments to, to the people who are not conversant with the languages of the other members. This will do much good to yourself as well as your audience. I have every hope that you can turn yourself into a very good English preacher if you serve the mission to inculcate the novel, novel impression of Lord Chaitanya's teachings in the people in general, as well as philosophers and religionists. Now that this is in between World War One and World War Two, you know that there's there's turmoil in the world. Um, India is not does did not have the kind of respect that it, India and prominence that India has today, and certainly Bhakti Siddhanta was not a well known figure in the world on the world stage, but he was very very powerful, spiritually powerful, and he had a powerful vision. The powerful vision was largely what he received from his his father, but also from the, the, the teachings of Lord Chaitanya, because Lord Chaitanya made many predictions. Uh, just a little sharing with all of you. Uh, <laughs> I just received a little video clip of some devotees in China that just had a kind of clandestine Rathiatra in Shanghai, in a right down a market street with shops on the left and the right and lots of people around. And the way that they did it, it was clever. There's a tradition in China that when a young woman becomes married, she dresses in some very fancy particular style clothes and she's put in a, in a, um, some kind of a conveyance that has wheels. And um, there are people that pull the conveyance with wheels through a public place. It's tradition for a young woman when she gets married. So they took the tradition. This was Anjan Mastami Day. This, you know, yesterday, China time was Jan Mastami Day. So they, they had a lady get dressed up like she just got married. She sat in a wheelchair because one of the devotees, the leaders in Shanghai had some, had broke his leg, so he had a wheelchair. So she sat in a wheelchair, dressed like she had just been married. They put a nice big picture of Jagannath Baladeva and Subhadra behind her, you know, tall enough so it was above her head sitting in the wheelchair. And... Uh, singing Hare Krishna, going through a, a public public uh, marketplace. I mean, you know, so I saw a little video, and there's people on either side, and shops on either side, and people are thinking, oh, this this nice lady just got married. <laughs> <laughs> and the devotees were thinking, Jagannath Rathi Atra Gijai. In China, I mean, it's that anyway. Every town and village, right? So, how did that happen? 
it, it happened because of these exchanges passing on the mission from from teacher to student, and that student took it to heart. December 1936. So Srila Prabhupada took both of these instructions as his life's mission. One, go to the West, Lord Chaitanya's message. Then English, you'll be, you know, you're a good speaker, you're a good writer. I'm sure Krishna will empower you. This is your mission in life. A period of deep reflection and study followed these, this, these exchanges. Srila Prabhupada greatly revered this scholarly, spiritual teacher and his writings assiduously. So he studied Bhaktisiddhanta's writings as well as the previous acharyas from whom Bhaktisiddhanta was drawing his teachings. And so he intensely prepared himself. So let's, let's do the math. It's 1930. 22 they met, and add, the notes here, add 43 to 22. What does that come to? Look at that. That's when Prabhupada got on the Jaladuta, right? Yes? Yeah? So 43 years of prepar 43 years of preparation, 43 years of preparation. Now he's initiated during that time, but even before initiation and now after initiation, he's preparing himself for this improbable journey. The life and works of Bhakti Siddhanta's father, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, also revealed much to Srila Prabhupada about the spiritual heritage of Krishna consciousness and helped inspire him to propagate the science of devotional service through the English language. Now, Bhakti Siddhanta was fluent, not only fluent, his, his vocabulary in English surpasses any scholar I know, what to speak of any you know, re regular fellow. And his father was also... Bengali, Bengal born, but you know, no, not only was knowledgeable in Sanskrit, but very fluent in English. And he read in Bengali and 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 English, Bhakti Vinod Thakur. So he he prepared he he t took the teachings, very carefully considered them. They went inside now because it, it, it's he's to carry this message, so he needs to know the message and not only know the message, but live the message. In 1953, in 1953, Srila Prabhupada was 57 years old, and he had this business, um, a pharmaceutical business, and he quit that business in 1953. That is, he turned it over to his sons, who are now matured and they knew the business and so he gave them a successful business and moved in his life for around two years from 53 to 55 he was moving here and there he entered into another stage of life from family life to vanaprastha life and he en eventually ended up by the side of the river Jamuna, by the side of um, Keshigat. There was a particular place that he took residence for some time, and then he moved to the Radha Damodar Temple. And in 19, that was 1956, at the age of 60, so think of somebody that you know that's 60, and what they're gonna do when they're 60. They're, they're going to take it easy. Because <laughs> he's worked and raised a family and a business, and so take it easy time. But he's not taking an easy time. He has this mission that was given to him twice. The second time, by the way, was 
just a few days after the departure of Bhakti Siddhanta from his his guru from this world. Prabhupada is in Calcutta. He wrote a letter to Bhakti Siddhanta. What should I do? Oh, you're, I'm, I'm a householder. You have many sannyasis. They can do much service. What can I do? And he gave him the same instruction of become become part of the mission. Same instruction. So now he's in Vrindavan at the age of 60. And one of his god brothers, who is pictured here, Keshava Maharaj, was residing not far from Vrindavan in Mathura. Long story, but his god brother was also very learned. Keshava Maharaj was a very good writer. He was in charge of one of Bhakti Siddhanta's publications. Keshava Maharaj had requested Prabhupada to help him. You're living in Vrindavan, come and help me in Mathura. Not that he had to move, but help him with the writing projects for this publication. So he did, because they're, they were like-minded. But Keshava Maharaj was a sannyasi. So in 1959, Prabhupada accepted sannyas. I was sitting alone in Vrindavan writing. My godbrother insisted to me, Bhaktivedanta Prabhu, you must do it. Without accepting the renounced order of life, no one can become a preacher. So he, he insisted. Not he insisted. Practically, my spiritual master insisted. He wanted me to become a preacher. So he forced me through this godbrother. You accept. So unwillingly, I accepted. So here's a photograph. The one seated is his spiritual master, Diksha, his sannyas guru, Keshava Maharaj, and side by side another sannyasi. And Prabhupada is, of course, on the right side, our right side. And at that time, he was given this particular. He was before his birth name was Abai. Then he became Abai Charan. And then it was A.C. Bhaktivedanta. A.C. is the Abhay Charan. The family name was Day. So Abhay Charan was a diction name from Bhaktisiddhanta. A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, the title was given. So Bhaktivedanta is, is a title. It's uh, one who is very learned it knows the conclusive truths about bhakti or devotion to God. Bhakti, Vedanta. And while he was living uh, in Vrindavan, he had begun, as was part of the mood and the mission of Bhakti Siddhanta, to make publications. So in the English language, there was one in Hindi and there was one in Bengali. He did one in English his own publication called Back to Godhead Magazine. And from time to time, he would go into Delhi and meet people. This is a painting or drawing showing sitting in a tea stall, which is popular in Delhi, and uh, show people his Back to Godhead Magazine. And, you know, he would, he would practice his preaching. And uh, the, another purpose was to meet pious people so that when his mission was growing, he would have the funds necessary to print books and do the work that he had to do. When he went to Calcutta, excuse me, when he went to Delhi, this is a place where he would stay, in Chippiwada, you know, not at all a fancy place. And he also did um, some writing of Srimad Bhagavatam when he was at this place. And Chippiwada, this particular location, it's an area of Delhi, uh, he stayed in a place that was where there was a temple, a deity for worship. And he was a little disheartened to see that some of the families who were also living in that area were um, very materialistic. And although they were in a compound that was for a religious purpose, they weren't living their lifestyles that way. 
So he made note of that. They shouldn't use a temple as an apartment house, doing what they want. During this time, because he had turned everything over to his sons and his wife to take care of his wife, he didn't have money. He was not a pauper, but he didn't have money to do much of anything. So um, still, little by little by little, he got sponsors for his publication as he was writing the Bhagavatam. And slowly, slowly, uh, he was able to print the first two volumes of Canto I Srimad Bhagavatam. So up here on the shelf, there's some Srimad Bhagavatam Canto I. The one on the far left is thick, but it was printed in India in three volumes instead of one volume. Here's the, the, the deities in Chippewada, and here's the place where he stayed in Chippewada. And um, gradually he got the opportunity, this is not Chippewada, this is in Vrindavan. He shifted from uh, a small place over by Keshigat to a place that was right next to the uh, Samadhi of the predecessor Acharya Rupa Goswami, great personality, right in the courtyard of the Radhadamadar temple. So this is one of his rooms, and here's another one of his rooms. And looking out the window, this is, he did his little cooking and a little kerosene stove and offered everything to Krishna and looking out the window at what you see over here. The... Um, the Mahdi of Rupa Goswami. And at night, there was a particular uh, sadhu who was interviewed later, a uh, 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 Babaji named Hridayananda Babaji. And Hridayananda Babaji, when interviewed, explained, this is, I like this. He was... Um, Born at Radhakund, Brahmin born for his life, he had been a pujari, and he's now living at near the Radhadamata temple. The, he had a room, a ba little little Babaji room, up just a little bit above where Prabhupada was staying, because Prabhupada was staying on the ground floor, literally right in the courtyard of the of the temple. And this Babaji, when he was interviewed, um he was asked if he knew Prabhupada because he lived there, you know, just above. And his comment was, I've never seen, for my all my life, I'm 78 years old, I've never seen anyone that had sadhana like your spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada. He did many um unusual things. He worked hard into the night. And during when he first moved in, the Radhadamadar temple area was very austere. Today it's like spiffy. And then it was muddy and dirty and not kept nice. The rooms that, he, that Prabhupada stayed in, they were uninhabitable. So he had to invest some money just to make them habitable but he received this invitation from the local uh, Goswami who was in charge of the place, and he eventually moved in, and there he was. And this, this Madhusudana, excuse me, Hridayananda Babaji said, at night, there's this sound. What's that sound? Not you. Let's see if it continues. You just hit a button. Let's see if it stops. Okay. In the dead of night, he would hear someone crying. And he would hear that person crying, also chanting very loudly. And intermittently, he would hear 
this voice, because it was dark at night. There was, you know, weren't street lights and things like that. It was dark at night. But one night, it was a full moon night, so he was able to go up to his rooftop and look down on the courtyard where Rupa Goswami Samadhi is. And he saw Prabhupada on his knees with a, one of those little brooms sweeping in front of Rupa Goswami Samadhi calling. It's something still going. Hey, Rupa! Hey, Sanatana! Hey, Guru Dev, please give me your mercy. Without your mercy, I cannot do anything. Give me the mercy. Give me the strength that I may fulfill your orders. So here's the fellow, Hridayananda Babaji Maharaj. And uh, he, you know, he, he, I find it moving. He wasn't just, Prabhupada wasn't just assiduously working to prepare himself. He was, he, he was doing, but he was also calling for mercy. These two things are essential, effort and mercy. And as qualified as he was, he was feeling himself not qualified and needing the mercy and needing the mercy and needing the mercy. So in the course of his going sometimes to Delhi and so forth, he, he uh, met someone that came to him and said, I'm really worried about my son. My son has gone to America to earn his livelihood. And when he went to America to earn his livelihood, he married an American lady. And I don't know where his culture is, and I'm worried about my son. Is there something you can do? You're a, you're a sadhu. Is there something you can do? So Prabhupada put two and two together and came up with four. He said, uh, maybe I can, you can write to your son, and if your son extends a letter of invitation, then maybe I can get a tourist visa with him as the sponsor for my tourist visa. Like, how am I going to get to America? Two and two equals four. And so he, he wrote to this man, Gopal Agarwal. Agarwal is a very common Indian family name. And Gopal is another common first name, Gopal. Gopal. Gopal is the name of Krishna. Gopal means protector of cows. Gopal. Gopal Agarwal wrote back. Prabhupada received his invitation letter. With the invitation letter, he got a tourist visa to go to America. Here's Gopal Agarwal, the elder gentleman. When Prabhupada went bridge, that chubby fellow there on the right side was a little baby, little one, very small. And here's the, uh, the visa that he got. Now that's, a, that's nice, he got a visa, but he doesn't have any money to get, to get on an airplane or, you know, to, or anything. He didn't have any money to, to get in a passenger ship. So he went in time to uh, Sura, Samati Mararji, there she is pictured here, and he knew of her to be... Um, a, a devotee of Krishna. She's from a different lineage, a different tradition, but a great devotee of Krishna. And so in the course of time, he asked her to, to, to buy his to standing order of his books and things like that so she could financially help. And here's a little interview uh, uh, where she's t giving her story about Prabhupada asking her for passage in the uh, cargo ship in a little cabin in the cargo ship. You know, in addition to the captain and his staff, they had a little cabin for some passenger. And I'm just going to read. This is from Nilamrita. You're so old. It's so cold there. You'll die. She gave many arguments. But Prabhupada kept pleading with her. 
it's the cause, it's the mission that he wanted to serve and Krishna would protect him and he had that faith. She said, you can just stay here in Bombay in this big city, you can preach Krishna consciousness in Bombay. I'll help you support you preaching Krishna consciousness in Bombay. No, my spiritual master gave me this order to go to the English-speaking parts of the world. And she saw the depth of his faith, and so she finally yielded. And so the date, August 13th, 1965, is when he boarded the cargo ship. This is the improbable journey. So here's this little interview, and I hope it works. Here she is. He said that he would like to go to America. He was surprised. I said, Swamiji, don't go there. You are too old to go. It will be too cold for you. I said, are you are crazy. The old man, you are going to die. Who will look after you? What will you do then? Still he insisted. So I said, all right. So I made arrangement for him to go by Jalakipa. So talking with Swami H.C. Yes. What is the protection of this life? The protection of this life is to understand oneself. This is the beginning. Why are you suffering? If there is any solution of this suffering, so know yourself. Yes. Know yourself. Unpack that one, you get Krishna consciousness, but that was how he answered to a New York Post uh, radio interview. Here's his passport, and he got on the boat August uh, 1965. Sunday, he has he 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 kept a, a diary. Later, he gave that diary to Bali Mardan and the one of his disciples, and Bali Mardan had it published by the BBT, and now it's known as the Jaladuta Diary. It has the original handwriting, so he started from Calcutta. It's yeah. You know, this is his entry. You can't read his handwriting so well, so it's on the right. To start from Calcutta, by the Calcutta Mail. That's a a, a, um, a train line via Nagpur, starting from someplace at 19 hours in the evening. So much for the ticket. Luggage was booked. Receipt number. Blah blah blah. Paid 12 rupees. And um, he traveled from uh, Bombay to Calcutta. This is a nice photograph of Calcutta so many years ago. And here's another entry. Um, he went at, at that time first to a place, Chaitanya Bharati, New Delhi. And then... It describes he went to the Chaitanya Mat. Chaitanya Mat is the headquarters of Bhakti Siddhanta. He went and paid his respects to Bhakti Siddhanta, pleading once again for his blessings and permission. He went also to the place of Advaita Acharya, offered prayers. There was a, this nice. Lilamrita story that prior to this so going back the 1940s and 1950s Srila Prabhupada was preparing himself for this mission impossible and he went regularly dressed in regular um, clothes white khadi cloth you know because that was what Gandhi followers wore you know made by hand looms rather than from England, where it's, you know, fine by a machine. It was hand looms cutting. Anyways, and praying and praying and, and praying and chanting and crying. 
So when Pujari was interviewed, did you know this person? Here's what happened. Here's what happened. The, the ISKCON devotees came some years ago. The after Prabhupada had been in America. And they came to the birthplace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the Advaita Acharya's place, Shantipur. And they gave the Pujari a, a Back to Godhead magazine. And he looked at the Back to Godhead magazine and said, I know this person. Back in the 40s and 50s, he used to come and sit by the temple and chant very loudly and cry. With such emotion, I asked him, Is, are you okay? Is everything all right? He was living in a solitary way, but very, very focused on the mission that was given to him. So he went, before, before getting on the ship, he went to the same place and offered his prayers once again. And here is the date on the 10th of August. He started from King George's stockyard or dockyard, right from his Lilamrita. And news appeared in an Indian newspaper. On the right, it says what the newspaper says in Bengali. But, you know, it's some heralding, there's picture of Prabhupada, and he's making a trip who, and has a plan to have Srimad Bhagavatam translated in 60 volumes, etc., etc., from the newspaper. So that's a little surprising because he wasn't, he wasn't obscure. He was just a person. He was just one amongst several millions of people. But somehow notoriety came enough that he went into the news. Here's the permit for him to get on the boat. Sumati Mirarji's company is Sindhya Steam Navigation Company Limited. And there's the passage for Srila Prabhupada to have that cabin, cabin class. He maintained records like this. And here's the painting, August 13th, boarding the boat. Now, he, he, when he boarded the boat, he didn't have his books. They came later when they came down to South India, uh, some port, and they entered the port. And the books, the Bhagavatams, were loaded onto the ship. So this is at the age of 69, Think about what that means. At the age of 69, he got on a, aboard this boat. He was told by the owner, you're going to die crossing the sea. And then when you get, if supposing you don't die crossing the sea, what are you going to do there? You're this old man. What can do? He's got a mission and somehow that's what he's going to do. From the Lamrita, as the day of his departure approached, Bhaktivedanta Swami took stock of his meager possessions. He had only a suitcase, an umbrella, and a supply of dry cereal. I mean, when I get on an airplane, I don't just have an umbrella and a suitcase and a bag of dry cereal. And nobody on the other end. Either it's not somebody's going to pick him up at the airport or the, at the, the boat dock. That didn't happen. That's not what happened. And the books were loaded later. Here's something that Prabhupada had printed in India where he... he in India, he printed this to promote the Srimad Bhagavatam. That was his idea of how he would maintain himself financially once he got to America, as he had this little flyer. Later, we're going to see Sally Agarwal showing the flyer that Prabhupada gave her. So he had the books and this little flyer. When the day came for him to leave, he needed that confidence. He was making a momentous break with his previous life. And he was dangerously old and not in strong health. 
He was going to an unknown and probably unwelcoming country. To be poor and unknown in India was one thing. Even in these Kaliuga days, when India's leaders were rejecting Vedic culture and imitating the West, it was still India. It was still the remains of Vedic civilization. He had been able to see millionaires, governors, the prime minister, simply by showing up at their doors and waiting. Because he was a sannyasi. And that culture permitted him to see anybody. A sannyasi was respected. The Srimad Bhagavatam was respected. But in America, it would be different. He would be no one, a foreigner. And there was no tradition of sadhus, no temples, no free ashrams. But when he thought of the books he was bringing, transcendental knowledge in English, he became confident. And when he met someone in America, he would give him a flyer. There's the flyer. Srimad Bhagavatam, India's message of peace and goodwill. So he boarded the ship, and today the captain arranged a meeting on board the Jaladuta on account of Janmashtami Day. That was what we celebrated yesterday. And I spoke for an hour on the philosophy and teachings of Lord Sri Krishna. All the officers attended the meeting, and there was distribution of prasadam, means sanctified food. We're going to do the same thing later. The matter was radiographed to Srimati Mararji in Bombay. The ship is stranded on the Arabian Sea, about four miles away from the coast. We are in this position from 3.20 p.m. to 9.30 a.m. the next day. No, two days later. Two days later. So now they're going to load the books. At 10 a.m., we are now in the dockyard of Cochin. That's its southern port. The dock is peculiar because it is by nature full of small islands. Some of the islands are full with nice hutments, formerly known as British Island. I saw my books from Bombay arrived in five cases and the agents loaded them on the ship at 4 p.m. So there they are as a picture, at least, of the three volumes with the nice cover and then on the right side is without the nice cover, but a kind of a brown-colored hardcover printing, embossed, got his name on the front page, cover page. So that's Cochin. Here's a, a picture of, of the course of their journey. They traveled from the western coast of India through across the Arabian Sea and up the towards the Suez Canal. We started towards Red Sea on the western front at about 12.30 noon. The sky was almost clear and there was sunshine since the starting of the trip from Cochin Port. We are floating now on the Arabian Sea. My seasickness again began. Headache, vomiting tendency, no hunger, dizziness, and no energy to work. It is continuing. There are sometimes showers of rain, but for a short time. There was a fellow fellow passenger in my cabin. He was also attacked with seasickness. The whole night passed. In other words, it wasn't like a pleasant journey. Doesn't sound at all like pleasant journey. And for several days, he shows where he had heart attacks. August 25th through the 31st, he had no entries because he was down and out with a heart attack. Prabhupada 
one evening with a few disciples at his feet, reminisced about how he had come to America in 1965 and had suffered two heart attacks at sea. They say that anyone who gets a third heart attack, they must expire. I had two heart attacks on the ship. And then in New York, a third one paralyzed. Left side was paralyzed. I do not know how I was saved. And one girl, that captain's wife, she studied astrology. She said, Swamiji, if you can survive your 70th year, then you will live for 100 years. Srila Prabhupada and the disciples laughed. So, Prabhupada continued, somehow or other, I have survived my 70th year. I do not know whether they say I will live for 100 years, but 70th year was severe. Three heart attacks and paralysis. And I was without any family. At that time, none of you were with me. I was alone. I wasn't dependent on anyone. But on the ship, I saw that Krishna was going to save me. I was going for his mission. So there's this painting showing Krishna came to Prabhupada while he's lying in the Jaladuta, crossing the sea. Krishna placing his hand on his chest and giving him the benediction, I'm with you, I'll help you make your way. And you see the painting in the background. There's the Jaladuta in the black ship. And then there's Krishna with his whole entourage <laughs> helping him cross the sea with a Jagannath banner for a flag, huh? Pretty nice. Or another nice painting attending to depict something similar. Many personalities helping him become successful. Prabhupada said, on the night that I had one heart attack, Krishna, along with his incarnations, were rowing a boat. And the boat was pulling Srila Prabhupada's ship all the way to America. It's a dream. So here it shows where he was, passing through the Suez Canal. Passed it from his... From his Jaladuta Diary. Suez, Suez Canal, Port Said, and then Atlantic Ocean. Atlantic Ocean is supposed to be the roughest ocean, but this was the most peaceful sail over the Atlantic, according to the captain. At four o'clock in the afternoon, we have crossed over the Atlantic for 24 hours. The whole day was clear and almost smooth. I'm taking my food regularly, and I got some strength to struggle. There is slight lurching of the ship, and I'm feeling slight headache also, but I am struggling, and the nectari nectarine of life is Chaitanya Charitamrita, the source of all vitality. So there's the crossing through... Um, the Straits of Gibraltar, through the Suez Canal, Mediterranean Sea, and out the other side, and crossing the Atlantic Ocean. So now he's about to arrive in America. Today, the ship is plying very smoothly. I feel better today, but I'm feeling separation from Sri Vrindavan and my Lord's Sri Govinda Gopinath Radha Damodar. The only solace is Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita in which I am tasting the nectarine of Lord Chaitanya's Leela. I have left Bharata Bhumi just to execute the order of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati in pursuance of Lord Chaitanya's order. I have no qualification, but have taken up the risk just to carry out the order of His Divine Grace, I fully depend on their mercy so far away from Vrindavan. So 
This is September 10th, Friday, and then Monday. Today is the 32nd day of our journey from Calcutta. Here's what the text looks like in his diary. He's at the harbor in Boston, and he's going to write a nice poem. After midnight yesterday, the lurching decreased, and I felt relief. In the morning also, I could not take my breakfast properly. Then I cooked bati cha churi. It appeared to be delicious, <laughs> and I was able to take some food. Today I have disclosed my mind to my companion, Lord Sri Krishna. There is a Bengali poem made by me today in this connection. At about 11, there is a little lurching. The captain tells me they have never, they have, they had never such calmness of the Atlantic. I said, it is Lord Krishna's mercy. His wife asked me to come back again with them so that they may have again a calm Atlantic Ocean. If a Atlantic would have shown its usual face, perhaps I would have died. But Lord Krishna has taken charge of the ship. So he's, here's a photograph of Srila Prabhupada, not that particular time, but later. He went to the Commonwealth Pier in Boston where the ship had landed, 5.30 a.m., and he wrote in Bengali, this nice poem. The Boston Harbor, September 1865. Here's the verses. Because if th this is long, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Just quickly, the, the, the translation. My dear Lord Krishna, you are so kind upon this useless soul, but I do not know why you have brought me here. Now you can do whatever you like with me. But I guess you have some business here. Otherwise, where would you bring me to this terrible place? Most of the population here is covered by the material modes of ignorance and passion, absorbed in material life. They think themselves very happy and satisfied, and therefore they have no taste for the transcendental message of Vasudeva. I do not know how they will be able to understand it. But I know your causeless mercy can make everything possible because you are the most expert mystic. How will they understand the medals of devotional service? O oh Lord, I am simply praying for your mercy so that I will be able to convince them about your message. All living entities have come under the control of the illusory energy by your will, and therefore, if you like, by your will, they can also be released from the clutches of illusion. I wish that you may deliver them. Therefore, if you so desire their deliverance, then only will they be able to understand your message. The words of Srimad Bhagavatam are your incarnation, and if a sober person repeatedly receives it with submissive oral reception, then he'll be able to understand your message. He will become liberated from the influence of the modes of ignorance and passion, and thus all auspicious things, inauspicious things, accumulated in the core of their heart, of the heart, will disappear. How will I make them understand this message of Krishna consciousness? I am very unfortunate, unqualified, and the most fallen. Therefore I am seeking your benediction so that I can convince them for I am powerless to do so on my own. Somehow or other, O Lord, you have brought me here to speak about you. Now, my Lord, it is up to you to make me a success or failure as you like. O spiritual master of all the worlds, I can simply repeat your message. So, if you like, you can make my power of speaking suitable for their understanding. Only by your causeless mercy will my words become pure I'm sure that when this transcendental message penetrates their hearts, they will certainly feel gladdened and thus become liberated from all unhappy conditions of life. O oh Lord, I'm just like a puppet 
in your hands. So, if you have brought me here to do to dance, then make me dance, make me dance, O oh Lord, make me dance as you like. The conclusion, I have no devotion, nor do I have any knowledge, but I have strong faith in the holy name of Krishna. I have been designated as Bhaktivedanta, and now, if you like, you can fulfill the real purport of Bhaktivedanta. So that's a very celebrated poem he wrote while in the Boston Harbor. And in a couple of days, the boat leaves Boston, goes to New York, and this is a painting Sunday the 19th, 38th day of his journey. Alive, he reaches the port in New York about three hours later than the scheduled arrival time. So now he's walking down the, the gang, gangplank carrying a little suitcase and umbrella to go he doesn't know where. I mean, New York is not a friendly place. And the dockyards are an unfriendly place amongst unfriendly places. So what happened is he had to go through customs and immigration. When he went through customs and immigration, there's this conversation. His servant, Hari Sori, said, if you're only sponsored for one month, how is it you're able to extend your visa all the time? Prabhupada, I was extending. The immigration officer came in Boston in my boat. He inquired about this. He asked me, Sir, Swamiji, how long will you want to stay? So I thought that I have no shelter. I have no money. But I have got the return ticket. So I did not know how long I... He asked me, how long you want to stay? So I thought... In these circumstances, I can stay at most two months because I have no means where to stay, how to eat, where shall I go. So I may struggle for two months. So I told him, I may stay at most two months. Immediately, two months, sanctioned, immediately. I could not think that I shall be able to, that one month were there sponsoring. So I thought, Another one month, that's all. This gentleman has sponsored for one month, so that is guaranteed. Then I can stay another one month. That's all. So after that, I was staying here and there without any fixity. So I was extending the visa each time. I was paying $10, another three months, another three months like that. And when one year was finished, they refused, no extension. So here's Srila Prabhupada staying in Butler, Pennsylvania. At the top is Sally Agarwal. And that's uh, Gopal Agarwal's wife. She's holding in her hand this flyer that Prabhupada gave her to promote his Bhagavatam set. Down below is the little boy bridge that you saw before when he was growing up and kind of robust. And this is the house in which he stayed for a little while. Uh, he didn't exactly stay in the house. He stayed at a YMCA in Butler, Pennsylvania. That's the little room that he stayed in, the YMCA in Butler, Pennsylvania. Now, when he was in um, India, there was a publisher friend. And the publisher, he asked the publisher friend, do you have any friends in America? said, yes, I have a friend in America. His name is Dr. Mishra. So Prabhupada moved from Butler, Pennsylvania to a place in New York City to stay in an apartment, not, a, an, a, not, not an apartment, excuse me, an office room that was owned by Dr. Mishra. Now here's Dr. Mishra above and Prabhupada's meeting with him. And down below is Dr. Mishra had a yoga ashram somewhere in upstate New York. Upstate New York means just above New York City. So Prabhupada, when he was in 
India, he wrote to Dr. Mishra, and Dr. Mishra said, yes, if you come to New York City, you can stay. I'll give you a little room. No windows, no toilet, no ventilation, no bed, no water, no sink. <laughs> a room, like an office. So that's where he stayed for some time. Very austere. And when he stayed there, he sometimes went to the upstate ashram and uh, conducted classes with Dr. Mishra's yoga group. And after some time, there was uh, a young fellow named Robert who eventually became his disciple. And Prabhupada spent hours and hours teaching Robert about the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. Eventually he met another whose name was David and he had a loft in the Bowery and Prabhupada was given a small room. So he moved from Dr. Mishra's apart not apartment, his, his office room with no ventilation and no windows to a loft. And the, the loft there was another fellow that was a crazy man. He was a drug addict. And um, so that, that drug addict broke into Prabhupada's living space, stole his Bhagavad Gita manuscript, and stole his little you know, manual typewriter, which is kind of worthless, but he stole it. So the devotees that knew Prabhupada, the young man that knew Prabhupada, thought it was dangerous. So they shifted him from that loft in the Bowery to another place. Carl Jurgens took him to his place, who was living with his unmarried girlfriend. And they had cats and dogs in the apartment. Prabhupada. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, eventually... Um, the devotees managed to, to get the funds together in 1966. Mukunda, who was then Michael Grant, helped Prabhupada find another place. Um, the rent was $125 for the storefront, and then behind it was a, an apartment. The rent was $71. Sumati Mirarji was contacting Prabhupada saying, you should come back. <laughs> what are you doing there? He wrote to his god brothers to send some brahmacharis. No response. He's alone. But eventually, he managed to get this storefront that you see it was called the Matchless Gifts. It was like a gift shop and then it became vacant. And so the devotees rented it vacated storefront, matchless gifts. And then in the back, there was little, still is, a little courtyard, and up above was one of one apartment that they rented for Prabhupada. So that's how he started. 26 Second Avenue, that's the matchless gifts and the little apartment behind. And after conducting activities, as you see, you know, th there's a, painting of the Panchatattva on the front window and devote young people coming in and Prabhupada having kirtan and speaking Bhagavad Gita's message. Slowly, slowly it started to grow and slowly, slowly it started to grow. And then eventually they made the suggestion, why don't we take this into the public? Prabhupada was very happy. He went to Tompkins Square Park. It's a photograph that appeared in the each East village other. This is Prabhupada standing with a crowd of young people around him. There's this church steeple in the background and the elm tree. Now it's, the whole thing is more grown up. But he, he was quite a, a spectacle for the young people in the counterculture era in New York City. So that's where it all began. And he would have kirtan sometimes in uh, in the park, 
And there's different people with different stages of their you know, lifestyle being exhibited as they were sitting with Prabhupada. I think this is in San Francisco in Golden Gate Park. Here is at Tompkins Square Park. And we're almost done. This is the 50th anniversary celebration for ISKCON. And from the time that he came in this country in 1966 until he left the world in 1977, here's a list of some of his contributions. Built over 100 temples and farm communities. Traveled the world 14 times, all continents. Wrote over 80 books, wrote or translated 80 books. Wrote 700 letters. Dictated 22,000 pages of text. Initiated over 5,000 disciples. Recorded conversations published in 48 volumes. So the conversations were transcribed. Lectures of his classes were also transcribed in 18 volumes. He established the BBT, which became the world's largest publisher of traditional literature from India. The Back to Godhead magazine, at the time that this uh, publication, this centennial year, he the, the the circulation of Back to God at magazine was one million worldwide, and largest vegetarian food relief programs. We'll see something about the food relief programs at the very end. A little short video clip. This is a statement from Chaitanya Charitamrita where it says, Lord Chaitanya says this is Lord Chaitanya. Lord Nityananda, Advaita Acharya, and other associates having Sankirtan chanting, in every town and village of the world the chanting of my name will be heard. So there was a prediction, and Prabhupada made that prediction possible by traveling around the world and introducing the message of Krishna consciousness in every one of those places, like how it happened in Russia, and it did during this Soviet era, era, and it was interesting. It's all very interesting. It's all very interesting. You know the story of how it happened in Moscow, right? Do you know the story? The, the, the person that was traveling with Srila Prabhupada as his personal assistant was taking two to three hours just to find edibles because meat was available, but vegetables and fruits and grains weren't available in the marketplace in Moscow. So there was one young man who was helping him find stuff. So that young, he took, when he met this young man, the young man came to meet Prabhupada. He wanted, was curious. And that young man, Prabhupada, spent time with him now, you weren't supposed to bring books, but he, he gave him a, a, a book, and the young man translated the book into Russian. It was the first Russian back to, um, Bhagavad Gita. And that young man became the leader of the Russian Yatra in course of time. It was just circumstance. Krishna parachuted the young man into Prabhupada's room, and he became the leader of the Russian Yatra after Prabhupada left. And then, because he was a a leader type of person, he you know, things grew and grew and grew and grew, starting in Moscow. And how did he get to Moscow? He was writing letters to the people. So there was a professor of Indology, I think that was his department, in the University of Moscow, a very prestigious university. And the professor wrote a letter to Prabhupada, yes, please come. It's a letter of invitation, so he got a visa to go to Moscow. And then he met the professor, and then he met this young man, and he started the Hare Krishna movement. Krishna's arrangement for all the way, every step, every step, every step. You know, how austere was all of that? 
most of us would not survive, what to speak of, even try to do something like that. But anyway, and where is ISKCON today? Over 650 temples. This was at the time of, the number you saw was at the time of Prabhupada's departure, 1977. 650 temples. This is more than that now. 520 million books published and distributed. Three million of, you know, the food for life. Three billion, excuse me, plates of food for people. 12 million people go to temples. 100,000 devotees formally initiated. That's in ISKCON at that, at, during this particular year. Two million that's the number of meals distributed every day to schools by the ISKCON India Food Relief Program. Midday meal program. 340,000 patients treated at the Bhaktivedanta Hospital in Bombay, many of whom became devotees. 2.6 million devotees walked, this is the Padiyatra, through villages and villages and towns throughout all of India. 2.6 million devotees walked that distance. More than 600, excuse me, one in 6,000 Hare Krishna festivals held every year. Anyway, it's big numbers, big numbers, big numbers, big numbers. There's his books. There's a list of some of the books, etc. Here's the languages in which the books have been translated. 80 languages. Many of these books are studied in universities with um, accolades given by professors of the universities of the value of these books. Temple of Vedic Planetarium. It's not completed, but it's under construction. Planetarium. What's a planetarium? Planetarium is an exhibition, like a museum, where it's meant to depict cosmology or the structure of the universe, three-dimensional, not just a book. So he left a mission for some of his followers to build this temple of planetarium, and it's under, under process, very expensive very uh, intricate. There's lots of other text here. I'm just going to skip it because of time. And academia, the works of the Bhaktivedanta Institute has been recognized in different, different places to the aim of promoting the wisdom of the ancient Vedic texts in the intellectual circles and so forth and so on. So they have conferences and so on and so on and so on and so on and so on. Oxford Center and the Harvard Divinity School both have um, recognized the work of the Bhaktivedanta Institute and the scholars who have been who have graduated from there, etc., etc. I'm just not going to do all this. In 1998... Former Prime Minister of India wrote, The voyage of Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada to the United States in 1965 and the spectacular popularity his movement gained in a very short spell of 12 years must be regarded as one of the greatest spiritual events of the century. So the improbable journey. And CNN listed Prabhupada as among 10 famous folks who launched careers after 50. <laughs> President of India, Pranab Mukherjee, 2013. Swami Prabhupada's greatest legacy was that he was an exemplary ambassador of India's timeless values. So President of India. In the years that he spent spreading his simple message, Swami Prabhupada convinced hundreds of thousands of Indians and Westerners about the profound value of his philosophy, 
which they embraced along with a Vedic lifestyle. Nelson Mandela, so forth and so on. Barack Obama, so forth and so on. Prime Minister of the UK, so forth and so on. So he, he impacted a lot of leaders, or his followers impacted a lot of leaders. And this is the final, this is a little documentary on the occasion of the, the centennial anniversary, and I hope the technology works. so strongly that mantra is the answer to the turmoil and the disconnect between people's hearts and their external lives. I made close to $170,000 in my first year. Over time, it became clear to me that money doesn't really buy happiness, doesn't really buy true love. I tried to bring a certain element of humanity in a place that was all about money. Eco Valley Foundation is mainly dealing with environmental, economic and social sustainability. Um, I felt like I wanted to come back and teach in the Gurukul because I had such a nice experience here. All my friends grew up here, we all grew up as one big family, one big community. There's no satisfaction greater than being an instrument of God's grace to people in need on all levels. We're grateful to these children that they allow us the highest privilege of serving them and being blessed by doing so. Composition of the community is worldwide and we're all here for the same purpose, to develop our own spiritual life. You go on the playground here and you're going to see, you know, a Russian kid, a Chinese kid, an Aussie, a Bengali. They have this unity. We should be always having a divine party at every moment of our lives, everywhere we go. We want to see everyone happy. Okay, so that's nice little video production on the hundred the fiftieth anniversary, I was saying hundredth, fiftieth anniversary of Srila Prabhupada establishing ISKCON. There we go. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So in honor of Srila Prabhupada's appearance, it's nice to remember some of the many, 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 many challenges that he faced and contributions that he made despite those challenges, how he was fully dependent upon Krishna to achieve what he achieved, put at risk many different ways, protected in many different ways, you know, things that most of us will never have to go through, but Prabhupada went through for, for what? You know, this is this little, everyone should be happy. Inspiration. 
any discussion? How do you say something further on that one? It's hard to follow up. <laughs> Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, um, I understood that yeah, Krishna helped Srila Prabhupada in each phase of his life. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but, but, yeah, like, how did he arrange the money? Like, of course, Krishna helped, but what was the medium so that he got money to, you know, carry on further? Well, the, the the initial, I mean, the, his plan, he had a plan, he wasn't full. His plan was he had books. He, ha he, he worked on producing and preparing the books before he got, but the publication of the books, he had nothing, so it was just charity in India to a sadhu to publish his books. And, and uh, they, they, were, you know, they had some conviction about him so it was the character and the capacity that he was endowed with by Krishna to persuade people in addition to his being in the renowned order. But, you know, their, their, their willingness to support such a holy man. So the publication. And then the, the survival was through the medium of his books. Now there was no, you know, now there's communities. There was no community. So your question was, how did he manage the finance? Of course, Krishna, but there must have been some instrument. So different, different. He had his ingenuity through his books. So he was relying on that. Now, there must have been, like you know, Carl Jurgens, his name was mentioned. So he had some savings, and he, he wanted to help Prabhupada, so he gave him some of his savings. Or Michael Grant, who later became Mukunda Maharaj, you know, he was a musician that had some savings, so he gave something to Prabhupada. So, little, little, little here, little there, little here, little there, and his books, and that was how he maintained. But his understanding, your, his understanding was it was Krishna, and Krishna selected different people or gave the opportunity to different people to help little, 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 and that's how it started. There was a, a devotee in California named Jayananda. He was a taxi cab driver, not a, you know, a wealthy kind of occupation. And, and he, Prabhupada didn't ask, but the taxi driver Jayananda gave him $50,000 you know, to print one of his books because then the printing, the print runs weren't big. He just needed something. And so he, he gave his life savings to Prabhupada. He gave his life to Prabhupada. But, you know, here and there. There's a nice story when, you, you probably know the story, but it's nice to hear it again. Bhakti Siddhanta had sent two sannyasis, the funds to, to go from, from India to England to establish Krishna consciousness. There were 64 Gaudiamas, some of them are little tiny places, and, you know, they gave, he, he instructed them, give a small donation to these two sannyasis. So they had support, financial support from the organization. And they came back empty-handed. Later, so many years later, 20 plus years later, Prabhupada sent three of his American couple, married couples to England. And they... One among them was Shama Sundar, who wrote a book called Shoot for the Rhinoceros. Have you seen the title of that book? Okay. And that is a phrase that Prabhupada used, when, when you try for something, 
go for like Mission Impossible, and if it doesn't happen, then you know it's okay because it's Mission Impossible. Shoot for the rhinoceros. So they use the phrase. They they were sent to England, and their thought, their meditation was going to going to London. If the Beatles became Hare Krishna devotees, the world would become Hare Krishna, influenced strongly by Krishna. So that was that was the rhinoceros. So they they went regularly to the recording studio and brought prasadam because they were really good cooks, particularly Jamuna. But you know, so they just brought prasadam. They didn't meet the Beatles. They just brought prasadam. This is for the Beatles at the Apple Record Studio. And so slowly, slowly, they started to get to know them. And as they slowly, slowly started to get to know them, um, Prabhupada asked, have, you, have they ever offered donation? They said, no, we have a strict policy. We never ask for anything. And they haven't offered anything. So Prabhupada said to Shamsundar, you should ask George Harrison, who was the most favorable amongst them, for a donation for my books. He had a number, I think it was... Some number, well, I forget the number, whatever the number was. And he said, well, we never asked them for money. He said, ask him. So on the order of his spiritual master, he went to the recording studio, brought Prashadam as was usual, and then invited a conversation where he was going to ask him for some money. And when he got to the point of asking him, you know, for what? First was for book publication. And then he gave the number. And the lights in the recording studio went out. <laughs> London, you know, not like countryside. London, the lights shut out. It was dark for quite some time. And when the lights came back on again, George said, okay. <laughs> you know, his, his facial expression when he asked was like, Oh no! I knew this was going to come. You know, something like that. But you know, he was a devotee. George was a devotee. He wasn't just, you know, a good musician. He was a devotee. Anyway, so that's one of the ways that somehow it's little by little, it, persons were given the opportunity to be instruments, and they helped. Yes. So, uh, in one of the quotations, Srila Prabhupada mentions uh, this was the 1959 one. Unwillingly, I took up sannyas. Yes. So, why was he unwilling to take up sannyas if it would help with well, preaching? Well, two two reasons. Humility, meaning you know he he had the credential, but. Many people, unfortunately, want recognition without having qualification. And it's a title. It's a position of respect and prestige. And he was unwilling to take that position. I was unwilling. Anyway, without, you know, but it was, it was just his, his natural humility. And although he was already living the lifestyle of a renunciate, there was, you know, some cultural tendency to be concerned about his family, etc., 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 and that meant cutting the tie of that, you know, formal cutting of the tie of that affection for his family. At least he, you know, he describes like that. It was not easy. It was easy, but not easy. It's just part of, you know, the the business of being involved in the material world for so long. There's some affinity for the material world, and he so he wasn't being uh, he was be, not, not being disingenuous. It was just I I, I want to do this in a way that's genuine. You must. So he accepted. 
but then that the strength from his god brother he took it it was coming from his spiritual master okay i have another question though okay sure uh so we talked about how it took him 43 years to prepare himself yes. before he left so what were the indicators for him towards the end of this 43 year period that that is the right time to to do well, to the indicator many but one of the big ones was he was a very strict or that is strict isn't the right word you know a, a very faithful follower of his spiritual master so as his spiritual master wanted before sending the two sanyasis to england he wanted them to have a publication to carry with them shri Ch shri krishna chaitanya was a, a two volume book about that thick each volume to be carried with them to in, in a form of a printed literature to explain to people that they would meet who is lord chaitanya what is his teachings that was the mission following his spiritual mastery wanted to do the same faithful follower so he didn't take that same book he took the bhagavatam canto 1 and 3 parts and that's what he was waiting for the time was ready when the third volume was printed because that was his carrying the message it was his mouth and his heart but it was also literature because his spiritual master said if you ever get money print book so he was the medium was through book distribution book publication and distribution and when the third volume was done that was the signal the time has come and then you know by divine arrangement or krishna's arrangement the visa came the the letter of invitation from gopal agarwal and then the visa was given by the us immigration in delhi and then was the passage and then the passage came so it was the time was everything was the alignment was all there that was the time mainly so I, my understanding is completing the bhagavatam first canto i mean it was the mission but it was also the means of maintaining himself the practical part as well as the mission part because how could he go to a foreign country with nothing he wanted to bring something and give something and receive something practical yeah back again part 2 you got to hit the button Maharaj, my humble request to you: If you could share your story, how did you meet Prabhupad? And uh, okay, I'll make it short. I was a college student at the State University of New York at Buffalo. I didn't know who Prabhupad was, but he was on a tour traveling with Allen Ginsberg. Have you heard his name? Have you heard Allen Ginsberg? you're not american he was a, a celebrated f famous or infamous american poet during the lsd era in counterculture era a kind of stream of consciousness poet type that created a genre that was unique and he was a celebrity and allen ginsberg liked india and he liked hari krishna mantra So Prabhupada and Allen Ginsberg were, were moving together through some universities across the east coast of the USA and one of the places they stopped was the university that I was attending because there was a center at the university how that center at the university started was back at 26 2nd Avenue 26 2nd Avenue there was somebody there was visiting 26 Akin Avenue from Buffalo and they spoke to Prabhupad saying if you send a student of yours to Buffalo to start a center then I'll provide the means to maintain the center this was one of your questions and so Prabhupad selected a, a devotee Rupanuga 
nice devotee. And had so he had a little center on Englewood Avenue, right across, almost very close to the the main the main street, and then one of the side streets off the main off Main Street was Englewood Avenue, right across from the the, the campus. So Prabhupada came to the campus at the invitation. So there was a club on campus. There were more than as many other things, but. Um, so th- that's where I first met Prabhupada. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know nothing about nothing. And there they were in the filler. What is it called? The Fillmore Room? Millard, Millard Fillmore. Some room. An assembly hall. And they were on stage. It's just, so I didn't know. I, I was walking through the student union to go visit a friend. And when I was walking through the student union, the ground floor, over on the right, there's this crowd around the Millard Fillmore room entrance. So I, you know, I was curious, what's inside? So I wiggled my way through the crowd at the entrance and went inside. And there on the stage were Prabhupada and Allen Ginsberg. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know what was going on. But that's my first encounter. And just hearing this chanting of a pure devotee had an effect that I didn't understand at the time, but later I understood. And I heard, you know, Prabhupada spoke after chanting. He spoke very briefly because people were intoxicated up to the ceiling. And, you know, and invited people to come to the center and distributed books and prasadam. That was my first Krishna orchestrated it. Some other things happened too. Krishna orchestrated. Way in the back. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, I heard you speaking about um, in another lecture a few days back. Um, you all used to wake up at 4.30 in the morning and Mangalari and chanting and Tulsi Puja. That was your life. Um, to, um, and those days devotees didn't have much to eat or proper place to sleep and things like that. Today we have everything. But it's so difficult to wake up at that time. <laughs> what was the question? What was it like? No, today we have everything. Okay, it, okay. But to wake up early morning, 4.30, it's very difficult. Oh, no. And it's not like, you know, we didn't have proper food. And, the, you know, they're, 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 we were packed like sardines. You know, there's the ashram and we just had a sleeping bag. But we had proper clothes and we had proper food and it was proper warmth and there was proper everything. Just wasn't, you know, comfy. But we had our necessities. But yes, waking up 4.30. You don't wake up at 4.30? Really? I'm surprised. Your mother doesn't wake up at 4. Do you wake up at 4.30? Really? How about you? There's three, no, it's three family members. I'm. Huh? You're passing the buck. <laughs> Well, we didn't wake up at four four thirty. We Mongol Auntie was at four thirty. <laughs> you know, that, and, and, and one might say, "Well, we were young and energetic and." And I'm not old, I'm still energetic, but you know, <laughs> four o'clock for me is late. Late. I don't like it. Three o'clock is all right. Before three o'clock is better. And it's just, you know, those of you that don't get up in that at that time, it's really simple. You just, 
It's conditioning. I mean, you just do it. Your body clock becomes used to it. It's really simple. Here's an Ayurvedic thing that I heard from my Ayurvedic doctor, one of the one Ayurvedic doctor in New Jersey. Do you know there's an Ayurvedic doctor the devotees go to in New Jersey? Do you know about her? Huh? Teitelbaum. Jewish lady, but she, she has an MD, and she studied under Dr. Mishra, Vaidya Mishra. She really good, knows her stuff. She shared, she wanted to know, what ta- what's your schedule? So I told her my schedule, so that's very good. Mm-hmm. Then she shared from Ayurvedic point of view, that is, I don't know if it's confirmed in allopathic medicine, but if you, any sleep, that you do after 10 p.m. is less effective. That means you're gonna need more hours of sleep if you sleep after 10, and better is nine. Better to take rest at nine because your body will be more rested when you wake up in the morning. It's true. So the, the way to get up earlier is to go to bed earlier. And if you go to bed earlier, your body doesn't need as many hours of sleep if you go to bed earlier. So just go to bed earlier and get up earlier and then you can get up and your body clock gets used to it. Is that the little one? (laughs) One of them, okay, okay. You can do it. You, both of you can, you know, she's got a good excuse, but you don't have a good excuse. She has children. That's a good excuse. But at a certain age, then that excuse disappears too. <laughs> then it's just, it's your body clock gets used to it. And it's so much, you know, besides, uh, you know, the, the body clock becoming used to it, it's so nice. The early morning hours, there's not stuff going on. It's, it's, it's quiet. It's, it's mode of goodness time. It's not mode of ignorance time. It's mode of goodness time. And to do things in the mode of goodness time that are in the mode of goodness, it's so refreshing, invigorating. Kijai. You can do it. You're not a lazy person. You just set your mind to do it and just, you know, move in that direction. You can do it. You brought up the topic. I'm just <laughs> following the thread. <laughs> okay, I want you to wake up. And there's a way to do it. You go to bed early, you get up early. You go, that early doesn't necessarily mean no. Here, here's one for you. Here's two. Two people I know, one person, a god brother, for the busy business life, very successful business person, two o'clock in the morning, every morning, every morning. So he, you know, he had to take rest at a certain time in order to get up at two o'clock every morning. He wasn't a yogi, he wasn't Prabhupada that slept for you know, three hours a night. He was a business person, American business person, two, two o'clock every morning. Shamasundar, another person. You know Shamasundar because he came here for the Festival of the Holy Name. He starts his japa class at two o'clock in the morning, which means he's up before two o'clock in the morning because he had to take the bath. It's doable. And he did the same thing in Houston that we that he did here in Naperville. On the sixty-four round day, he's up. You know, starting the the temple was open at twelve o'clock, midnight, because it's the start of the next day, twelve o one. And just some devotees came and some devotees left, and you know, it, it that's that's extreme, but it's doable. And he's he's older than you.
So it's not age deficient. This other devotee also, he's older than you, and he has two o'clock. For, you know, for, his, for life. Doable. Okay. Something online. Look at this. This question is from Venu Madhurya Prabhu. Thank you, Maharaj, for your thorough overview of Srila Prabhupada's journey. Do we have information on who did the illustration for the beautiful cover of the Srimad Bhagavatam printed in India? No, I don't know. But, um, maybe BBT will know. He, if he really wants to know, he can ask the BBT. And the BBT may know. I don't know. Srila Prabhupada Ki? Okay. Quite an introduction, huh? Quite an introduction. Yeah. Eye, eye opening. Yeah. A great personality. And we're just hearing a little bit about his greatness and his contribution. <laughs> 